Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 86 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm Larry Erickson, I'm your host, uh, and I'll be here for about a half an hour ranting away at you. Uh, comments, questions, reactions can be sent to me at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and make a comment or get the email there, which you prefer. Um, with that very short introduction, because I've got a lot of stuff I'm going to try to get through today, we're going to get right to it. Oh, I should say this is for the week of December 13th and 19th, 2012, just so, you, just so for those of you that are keeping score. Uh, I've actually got something new, a new feature, and uh, it will be, I'm quite sure, considering the state of the world, an occasional feature on the show. I mean, I've got the Outrage of the Week, I've got the Clown Award, I decided we needed something else. I have a new Heroes Award. So we're going to start with hero number one. In fact, I've got two hero awards to give this week, um, just as a way of, uh, you know, kicking it off, getting it started. The first one actually involves two people. It all started 8 a.m. on December 1st. Uh, that was the time and day when Joven Belcher, he's a, he was a starting linebacker for the Kansas City Chiefs. He shot and killed Cassandra Perkins, the mother of his three-month-old daughter, he then got in his car, drove to the Chiefs training facility, thanked his coach and his general manager, and shot himself in the head, killing himself. Now, there was some criticism that got raised to the fact that the Chiefs went ahead and played their scheduled football game just 28 hours later. Other people defended the decision. They talked about moving on, they said, and uh, even how it would be unfair to the fans of the Carolina Panthers who had traveled all the way to Kansas City in order to see the game. Well, Jason Whitlock, he's a columnist for Fox Sports. He, he didn't see it that way. I'm quoting him here. I would argue that your rationalizations, that is for going ahead with the game. Your rationalizations speak to how numb we are in this country to gun violence and murder. We've come to accept our insanity. We prefer to avoid seriously reflecting upon the absurdity of the prevailing notion that the Second Amendment somehow enhances our liberty rather than threatens it. Our current gun culture simply ensures that more and more domestic disputes will end in the ultimate tragedy and that more convenience store confrontations over loud music coming from a car will leave more teenage boys bloodied and dead. Handguns, he wrote, do not enhance our safety. They exacerbate our flaws, tempt us to escalate arguments, and bait us into embracing confrontation rather than avoiding it. Well, NBC broadcaster Bob Costas used his halftime segment on Sunday Night Football to address the same issue. He actually mocked those who mouth platitudes about how things like this put everything in perspective. He said, and I'm quoting him here, those who need tragedies to continually recalibrate their sense of proportion about sports would seem to have little hope of ever truly achieving perspective. He then quoted Whitlock's column, including his declaration, that even in the face of speculation about concussion and brain injuries, what I believe, this is what Whitlock wrote, what I believe is if he, that's Belcher, didn't possess a gun, he and Cassandra Perkins would both be alive today. Costas, with his higher name recognition and his bigger platform, got most of the backlash, but neither he nor Whitlock is backing down. At a time when federal courts are declaring that states cannot even ban carrying concealed guns, at a time when yet again, 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 we have somebody going into a public place and shooting the place up, this case a mall in Portland, Oregon, leaving three dead and another wounded, uh, at a time when we continue to tell ourselves the childish fantasy that if only more people had more guns, we'd be safer than we are. At a time like that, Bob Costas and Jason Whitlock said what needs to be said. And for that, they are heroes. And we're going to go right from there to our second, just to get our, our heroes thing started on a good foot, uh, our second hero award. This goes to Joe Lucan of Bemidji, Minnesota. Uh, he owns a small chain of three grocery stores in the area. Well, after 46 years in the business, uh, Lucan, who is now 70, he suffers from Parkinson's, he's decided to retire um, and uh, spend the rest of his time traveling with his wife. Now, he learned his sons were not interested in carrying on the business. 
uh, and he was presented with offers from a number of national food store chains to buy his stores. So in the face of this, Lucan did what any decent retiring owner of a successful business would do. He's giving the business to his employees, giving it as in it will cost them nothing. Notice I said decent retiring owner, not typical. He said, I'm quoting him, my employees are largely responsible for any success I've had and they deserve to get some of the benefits of that. You can't always take, you have to give back. The method he's chosen is called an ESOP, E-S-O-P, and it stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan. These are plans that provide uh, employees an ownership stake in the business. They own stock in it. Now, in this case, the amount of shares each employee will get uh, will be dependent upon their length of time that they've worked at the places and what their pay was. The program is expected to pay off the Lucan family in three to five years for the sale. Now, these ESOPs, they were popular for a time in the 1970s. In fact, I was among the proponents. But they fell out of favor because the bosses started perverting the programs. They would set up employee stock programs uh, and then fund them with loans from the employees' pension funds. In essence, the bosses were looting the employees' pensions in order to shore up the stock price of the company. So they fell out of favor. But a difference here is that, uh, as news, news, news accounts indicate, that the employees will not be among the stockholders, they will be the stockholders. They will own the company outright, uh, or rather will when the transfer is complete. The other thing is that the fund is required to buy back the shares of any employee who leaves or retires, which means that at any given moment, the current employees are the 100% owners of the company. One of Luke and Sons said, um, we could have hired a gunslinger from Minneapolis, but that didn't sit well because the reward wouldn't go to the proper people. Now, it is both disturbing and revealing that getting the reward to the proper people, that is the ordinary workers that Luke and himself said were largely responsible for success, uh, it's disturbing that it's so unusual when this happens that it's worth noting. Doesn't change the fact that it is worth noting. And Joe Lucan, you are a hero. All right, we're moving on from there to anti-heroes with regard to workers. This is about Michigan. Now, ever since the, the goppers took control of the Michigan government, uh, governor and legislature, about two years ago, they have been drooling at the idea of destroying the ability of workers to join together to, to advance and protect their own interests. One of the plans for this was to make Michigan a so-called right-to-work state. Uh, Governor Rick Snyder, though, said, well, that wasn't on the agenda because it would be too divisive. But two things happened this past November. One is that a labor-backed proposal for a constitutional amendment to the state constitution that would have enshrined the right of collective bargaining uh, suffered a clear loss at the polls, which suggested a moment of weakness for labor. And two, the, um, the goppers lost seats in the legislature. So when the new legislature is sworn in in January, they won't be in as strong a position as they are now. So if you're going to do something, you had to do it right now. So last week, Governor Snidely Whiplash announced at a press conference that he would support a bill to make Michigan a right-to-work state. That was at 11 a.m. By 8 p.m. that same day, bills to do exactly that had been passed, had been introduced and passed by the state Senate without even any committee hearings, any public comment. After a mandatory five-day waiting period, the state House did the same, and Governor Whiplash um, signed the bill within hours. Now, the thing is, let's be clear. Let's be clear about what this bull about right to work actually means. I mean, first off, it doesn't have a single thing to do with having a right to work. It doesn't have a single thing to do with having a right to a job. So don't even think that. Legally, it means that workers cannot be required to join a union or pay a fee equivalent to union dues in order to work at a unionized business. Or more particularly, more exactly, these laws make it illegal 
for unionized workers to negotiate a contract that requires every employee who benefits from that contract to pay their share of the cost of negotiating and, and policing it. Now, in practical reality, in other words, what right to, right to work laws mean is the right to undermine unions, the right to see unions decimated, the right to see unions pushed out, the right, that is, to see workers return to being serfs on the Lord's feudal estates, the right to a shrunken future, the right to less pay, lower benefits, and no job security, the right to stand alone against the corporation as if you and they are on an equal footing. In other words, it is the right to get screwed. The thing is, these, these laws are being sold on two bases. Two bases. One, more jobs. That's one of the bases. But the fact is, studies have shown that right-to-work laws do not, they have not, boosted employment uh, in, in the states, employment growth in the states that have them. In fact, if a state is looking to high-tech jobs or you know, so-called knowledge jobs, that uh, these kind of laws actually hurt the state's economy. Now, the other argument about, uh, uh, in favor of right-to-work laws, the other argument that's used is fairness, or it's an extreme version, freedom. Again, the freedom is the freedom to get paid less, to have no say, to have no protection, the freedom to be screwed. But the thing is, why the push? Why the push? Why do these people want these laws? Why do they want them so bad? Because they know what they want to keep you from knowing. They understand what they desperately hope you do not understand. This is what they hope, what they understand, and they hope that you don't. The red line on that graph is profits, corporate profits as a portion of gross domestic product since the end of World War II. The blue line is wages as a portion of gross domestic product in that same time. I want you to notice the trend in that blue line, especially since 1970. In fact, look at this graph, or this graph. This is a, a Gini graph. Gini is a means, it's a, it's, a, it's a method of measuring inequality in a society. The higher the Gini score, the more unequal the income in a country is. This is how our Gini score has changed since 1965. All right, all right but what's, what's all that? What's all that got to do with this? What's all that got to do with what I'm talking about? Check this. Look at this graph. The blue line on that graph is the share of income going to the middle class over the last, uh, last several decades. The red line is the portion of the middle class that are members of unions over that same time. You can see they go down together. The less unions, the less income. You really think there's no connection? You really think there's no connection between that graph and what's been happening? You really think there's no connection between that graph and the anti-union campaigns of these goppers and corporate, corporate flax? They look. They look at this graph. They look at this graph and they know they are the red line and you are the blue line. And they see that blue line going down and they want it to keep going down. And because they know that that's what keeps that red line, what keeps them going up, and what keeps that Gini graph going up. When they say they're doing anything for you, they're doing it all for your benefit, they are lying to you. And we're going to take a break. And we're back. And while we're on the subject of... Uh, deceit and lies meant to harm the vast majority of us. Uh, one proposal being kicked around in order to avoid stepping off the purely mythical fiscal cliff is means testing, or the even more arcane version starting to appear now income-relating Medicare as a trade-off for the goppers agreeing to tax increases on the very wealthy, which most of the right wing are admitting are going to happen anyway, so why are the Democrats offering anything in return for this, which only goes to prove the Democrats really do want to cut Medicare. They just need a way to sell it to the public, which overwhelmingly, including even among majority Republicans, opposes any such idea. 
But here's the really important thing. This is the important thing about why the right wing would just love to income relate to means test Medicare. See, what, what means testing means is that uh, you target benefits, um, payments, tax breaks to people who are below a certain income level while denying them the same kind of benefits and tax breaks and payments and so on to people who are regarded as too wealthy to need them. Lots of federal benefits, both tax benefits and payouts, are means tested. Whether you get them and how much you get is dependent upon your income. The thing is, for most of its life, and still for the most part, Medicare is not. Once you reach 65, if you've worked and paid Medicare uh, taxes for at least 10 years, uh, then you're eligible for benefits, no matter what your income is. Medicare, that is, is insurance. Uh, it, you know, I mean, it is. It's insurance. I mean, consider, if you went out and bought insurance in the private market, bought health insurance, they're not going to ask you how much money you make. Your benefit depends upon the premium, not upon your income. Uh, if you bought life insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance, renters insurance, travel insurance, your benefit depends on the premium. The more you pay in a premium, uh, the more benefits you get. Uh, they don't, no, none of these people, when you go in to get your car insured, they don't ask you, what's your yearly income? Show us your latest tax returns. Medicare is and has been insurance. You pay a benefit, you, get a, you, get a, you pay a premium, rather, you get a benefit. Well, in 2007, a crack was opened in that foundation. Uh, since that time, the highest paid people the uh, highest income people who are enrolled in Medicare, uh, Parts B and D. Now, Part B is for, like, doctor's visits, outpatient care, and so on. Part D is the uh, um, that uh, um, prescription drug program. The, people, the highest uh, income people enrolled in those programs have to pay more for the same benefits. They pay a higher rate. Now, that still only affects only a small portion of the total, only about 5% of the people with Part B and about 3% of the people with Part D. The right wing would love to expand this. They would love to open that crack into a gulf. And I think it's not, it's not just the right wing who's in favor of this. Uh, Dick Durbin is for expanding means testing in Medicare. Max Baucus is for it. Claire McCaskill is for it. Emmanuel Cleaver, who chairs the, the, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, he's for it. And so is Barack Obama, who in fact offered it, it that exactly this thing last year. Last year, he offered, as part of his budget deal, raising the premiums on Medicare while keeping the income standards the same, so that after a while, 25% of the people who are in Parts B and D would be paying these higher premiums. All right, so what's the real problem with this? What's the problem with higher income people paying more? Means-testing Medicare fundamentally changes the nature of the program. Means-testing Medicare means it's no longer insurance. Means-testing Medicare means it becomes just another government giveaway, just more welfare for the 47% who will take responsibility for their own lives. Means-testing Medicare is just another right-wing trap. Just another snare, the ones that the Democrats will, uh, very, as they often do, walk into with their eyes wide open, knowing full well what they're doing, knowing full well their weapon they're giving to the right wing to attack Medicare, because, again, cutting the deficit is the most important thing ever, because the banks must be served. And what people are hurt in the course of your, your uh, offering your supplications to the gods of the banks... Hey, what do these people care about them? These people don't rely on Medicare. All right, we're moving on from there to our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. And this one's a little hard for me, uh, but um, I'll do it. Back in October, there was an incident in Afghanistan. I love that word, incident. What a wonderfully vague, meaningless, anesthetizing word. Incident. I think by comparison, uh, relating to this, my wife, she's a, um, she's a heart attack survivor. 
who uh, now actually gives talks on women with heart disease. It's free. Contact me if you're interested. Uh, but the thing is, she finds it really amusing that among the community of women heart attack survivors, the current vogue is to insist on calling women who have survived heart attacks champion. You're not, you're not a survivor. You're a champion. You're all champions. And to refer to the heart attack itself as an event. You don't ask people, when did you have your heart attack? You say, when was your event? Uh, you know, the thing, we don't want to use the words that actually express what it is we're saying. We want to shield ourselves from the reality. We want to hide behind euphemisms. I mean, my wife, she finds this hilarious. She really does. She thinks the whole thing is absurd. And she says, she says I didn't have an event. I had a heart attack. I almost died. You know, a block party, that's an event. Uh, a movie premiere, that's an event. A heart attack is not. It's not like those other things. We're using words intended to hide from ourselves the harshness of the reality we're expressing. So, okay, in October in Afghanistan, we have an incident. In this incident, Three children, ages 8, 10, and 12, were killed by NATO bombing while they were out gathering dung for fuel, which is comedy done there, as there aren't a lot of trees. Reports about this, as always, conflicted. One report said insurgents were bombed as they were digging holes to bury the mines, and the children were killed by shrapnel from those, from those bombs. They were just, in other words, collateral damage, one of the all-time great euphemisms. Another said that they visited the site of the attack right afterwards uh, and said there were only the children's bodies there. There were no adults there. There was only the children. The U.S. at first, of course, denied that any civilians were killed, only to say later that, yeah, yeah we probably killed ourselves a couple of innocent people. But the real thing is we got ourselves three insurgents. Woohoo! And that's really what's important. All right, here's the thing. On December 3rd, Military Times published a despicable piece by two staff writers arguing in effect that children are legitimate military targets because sometimes insurgents use kids. They called an unnamed Marine official at a Marine base in Afghanistan who actually suggested that, no, these, these children, they weren't innocent. They actually were the insurgents who were killed. A senior army officer in Afghanistan, quoted in this article, one Lieutenant Colonel Marion Carrington, uh, referred to in one of the more chilling euphemisms I've come across recently, opening the aperture. The aperture. This is what the military looks at, the aperture through which they look. They're opening the aperture so that our aperture now is not just looking for military-aged males, all of whom are assumed to be insurgents, but also, quoting him, children with potential hostile intent. But, you know, maybe we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is not new. This is not new. Maybe we shouldn't even be outraged. Or, no, that's not true. Uh, maybe what we should realize is that this is not the root outrage. This is not the root of it. Back in the early 1970s, there was an outfit called NARMIC, the National Action Research on the Military Industrial Complex. It was, um, this is a project of the American Friends Service Committee, which, as you probably know, is the uh, social action arm of the Quaker Church in the United States. And they had this slideshow about the automated air war in Indochina. This is during the Indochina War. And at that time, we were using sensors that we dropped in order to uh, set anti-personnel weapons and to guide where bombing should be. And at that time, they were already talking about what we're doing now, drone attacks from thousands of miles away. And the thing is about military targets, in the course of this slideshow, this is why I bring it up. In the course of this slideshow, they had discovered uh, an Air Force training manual. Now, remember, this is 40 years ago. I don't remember exactly what manual it was. But I was able to run down the exact quote that they got from this Air Force manual, which was defining a military target. This was the definition given by the Air Force. Any 
person, thing, idea, entity, or location selected for destruction and activation or rendering non-usable with weapons which will reduce or destroy the will or ability of the enemy to resist. So the fact is, anything that you think will help you win is a legitimate military target. Anything you think will hurt them is a legitimate military... If you think that blowing eight-year-old children to smithereens with drone strikes and bombing is something that will help you win, then eight-year-old children are legitimate military targets. And the thing is, when you buy into war, when you buy into the Afghan war, when you, buy, when you bought into the Iraq war, when you buy into the, to the uh, justifications for the, for the bombings of Pakistan and the drone attacks in Pakistan and Yemen and so on because, oh, better that than ground troops. When you buy into all of that, that is what you are buying into. And that is perhaps the biggest outrage of all. All right, I have to lighten things up a little bit with our other regular weekly feature, uh, the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. Now, the incident that, uh, per, uh, that uh, provoked this actually comes from a couple of weeks ago, but I decided to include it anyway because the, this week's dishonoree is so thoroughly uh, deserving. It's Rahm Emanuel. Yes, Rahm Emanuel, the man who before spending a trillion, yes, with a T, a trillion dollars to bail out the banks, said, I'm quoting, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. The man who was Barack Obama's chief of staff, called the liberal opponents of Barack Obama, retarded. The man who left D.C. to go to Chicago to become mayor and now continues to show his command of nutsoid indifference to reality. The Chicago Transit Authority uh, has announced some significant fare hikes for its buses and trains. Now, commuters are understandably upset, but Emanuel responded with, quoting him, fares stayed the same, basic fares stayed the same, which you cannot say about gas prices. Now, the thing here is, yes, basic fares, single trip fares stayed the same. But the cost of passes are going up significantly, and the commuters who make up 55% of the traffic on the system are the ones using the passes, you twit! But that wasn't enough for him. He suggested commuters who don't like the new fares are free to get behind the wheel and drive, saying, you will make that choice. It's a, simply a choice as to whether you drive or take public transportation, ignoring the fact that many of the people who rely on the Chicago Transit Authority don't have cars and can't afford them. Rahm Emanuel, we always knew it, but thank you for proving again, you really are a clown. All right, two last things I'm hoping to get to. One, uh, I just had to mention this quickly. Um, Pandit Ravi Shankar, the best-known Indian musician alive, one of the great musicians of the world, one of the great virtuosos of the world, a man who won three Grammys, who worked with the Beatles, who recorded with classical violinist Yehudi Menuhin, and brought 400,000 people to their feet at Woodstock, Ravi Shankar died December 11th in San, uh, San Diego, California. He was 92. He had performed as recently as November 4th but the stress of recovery from recent heart valve replacement surgery just, just proved to be too much. He will be missed. All right, last thing, and I assume I've got, I should have enough time for this. Oh, yeah, okay, a little short of time, but I'll do it quick. Uh, this is, and another thing, this is our occasional feature into, uh, venture into things like scientific, not politics, more for the fun of it. In 1962, I was in eighth grade. I remember how in February of that year, everything stopped so we could all gather in one classroom to watch John Glenn take off to become the first American to orbit the Earth. That was part of the Mercury program, which is followed by the Gemini program, which is followed by the Apollo program, which climaxed in a, at least in a, in, in a dramatic sense, by Apollo 11. July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to walk on the moon, first humans to walk on the moon. We sometimes forget that there were Apollo missions after that, except when Apollo 13 comes on the TV again. Um, but the fact is there were six more Apollo missions after the first moon landing, including number 13. 
But by the end of those, the public interest in space had waned. NASA was space facing budget stresses. And scientists were actually arguing that sending robot missions could do more uh, and learn as much or more at less cost and with less risk to human life. Um, and in fact, there have been some really amazing things we have done with some of these probes. We sent a rocket to a comet to blow off a piece. Um, we've gone back years later to look at a whole bunch of things. But it's worth noting, if only in passing, that the last Apollo mission was Apollo 17. And Apollo 17, this is the last time people walked on the moon, Apollo 17 took off, uh, rather landed, rather, on the moon on December 11th, 1972, 40 years ago this past Tuesday. And I just thought it was worth m mentioning. So that's it. I'm out of here. I managed to get it all in somehow. I'll see you next week. You have the best week you possibly can.